Hello, and welcome to worship with the First Congregational Church of Webster Groves. We're a member of the Church of the United Church of Christ, located near St. Louis, Missouri. I'm Marilyn Davis, your announcer for the day. This is our worship for Sunday, September 6th, 2020, the 14th Sunday after Pentecost and the Sunday of Labor Day weekend. This morning's worship has been prepared by Pastor Dave DeNoon, Music Director Leon Burke, our student ministers, Merriman Boyd and Elston McCowan, and a volunteer recording engineers, Herb Niemeyer, Sharon Love, and Linda Copetti. This service includes spoken responses and songs to sing. We encourage you to participate at home. The words for these are accessible from an order of worship document you can download from our website or from the description of this video on Facebook or YouTube. To prepare for worship, I invite you to center yourself by taking a deep breath and exhaling. Close your eyes. Greet God's Spirit here with me and there with you. Let our worship begin. Please join me responsibly in the call to worship. Pastor Merriman will be reading the responses and I invite you to say them with him at home. Let us be at peace among ourselves. And let us not repay evil 
for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for us. So we will not quench the spirit, but keep the words of the prophets and hold fast to what is good. As the body of Christ, let us say together our covenant. We who are called of God into this Christian community, covenant, covenant together to seek to know the will of God, to experience the joy and struggle of discipleship, to proclaim in word and deed the love of Christ, and to work for peace and justice among all people. We trust God's promise of grace and forgiveness and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our trials and rejoicing. I ask my sisters and brothers to join me in our prayer of approach. We gather here and there in your name, O Christ, and you are ready, already among us. Keep us open to your presence. Let us know you in us, around us, that we may grow closer to you when you call us, we want to be ready to go where you lead us. Sometimes we have been too complacent to hear your voice, too reluctant to leave what is familiar, too satisfied within common boundaries. So we thank you for your abundant grace, your never ending love, your unwarranted patience, forgiveness and blessing instill in us those same qualities and actions so that we may be as you are. Amen. I haven't had a chance to do children's time in a while, so uh, I 
encourage you young people who may be watching right now to gather a bit closer to the screen. I have a story to tell you. <clears throat> you probably all have heard the parable of the Good Samaritan. Do you remember it? Even if you think you don't remember it, I'll bet you'll start to remember it when I begin telling it right now. So, <clears throat> first of all, the setting. Jesus was teaching somewhere. Doesn't say where, it just says that he was teaching. When somebody came up who thought that maybe Jesus wasn't as smart as everybody said Jesus was. And that challenger asked, what must I do to be saved? Do you know what saved means? It means that God's favor rests on you. Uh, it means that, okay, so, um, God thinks that you are the bee's knees. No, that's probably too old a uh, metaphor for you. Um, it means that God thinks you are the cream of the crop. That's probably too much too. Okay, so um, God loves us no matter what, we know. But what this person was asking was, what makes God especially proud of us? How's that? Jesus asked the person a question. Jesus said, what does it say in the Bible? Actually, what Jesus said was, what does it say in the law? But what he meant was, what does it say in the Bible? It's more or less, you know. And the challenger, who knew the Bible backwards and forwards, said, love God and love your neighbor. You'll notice that's what I've been saying for the last four weeks. Love God and love your neighbor as, as you love yourself. Love God and love your neighbor. And this, uh, Jesus said, correct. That is what will save you if you do that. But the challenger was feeling especially clever that day and asked, but how do I know who my neighbor is? Well, Jesus thought about that for a moment. And he answered with a story. And this is the story that he told. There was this person who was on the road walking from Jerusalem to Jericho, pretty long distance, good day long journey. And, and some others saw this person and decided to beat the traveler up and take his clothes and all his money. They left the traveler there bruised and battered. Well, there's the traveler lying in the dirt. And a priest comes along, a holy person, comes along and sees that traveler lying in the dirt. You know what that priest does? Walks on the other side, just continues on. And then a Bible teacher came along and saw that person lying there in the dust, bruised and battered, practically dying. And you know what that Bible teacher did? Walked along on the other side and just walked right on past. Well, eventually, Jesus said, a Samaritan came along. Now, at this point, I should tell you a little bit about Samaritans. So, these were people who lived in the country between where Jesus lived up in the north and where the capital of the area was down in the south. So this is the Galilee, this is Judea, Samaria is right here. And nobody in the Galilee or the Judea loved the people in Samaria. They didn't even like them. They, they just thought they were terrible people. In fact, there are two gospels, Matthew and Mark, that say that when Jesus traveled from Galilee down to Judea, that he actually went around Samaria to avoid seeing any of the people there. They were that nasty as far as people were concerned. Even Jesus, Matthew and Mark says, say, didn't like Samaritans. Hmm. Well, so Jesus tells this story about neighbors saying that people you might have expected to stop didn't. But 
someone you would have expected to stop or to go on by, and frankly, someone that the injured person probably would not have wanted to take care of them, did stop. Imagine that. The Samaritan used the stuff he had with him to clean up the traveler's wounds, put the traveler on his own donkey, got him to the nearest inn, and paid the innkeeper there a huge amount of money in order to make sure that he was taken care of. And if this doesn't cover everything, the Samaritan said, I'll be back in a few days and I'll pay you whatever's left. Wow. Jesus turned to his challenger and asked, So, who was the traveler's neighbor? The challenger was impressed with Jesus' answer and probably embarrassed to have been such a jerk to have asked that silly question. But here's the thing that I think it's important for you to know. We know that we have to act like that good Samaritan, but the only place where we find an action like this in the New Testament is in a story that Jesus made up. And I'm about to tell a sermon in a little while, and one of the things that I'm going to be pointing out to people is This is made up. I don't have any examples to tell people of persons that actually experienced something like this. So it's up to us to change that, to make it so that we help not just the people that we like, not just the people that we love, but the people who we might not think that much of. Can you try that with me? Because it's going to be really hard. But let's do that. Because when we got to the end of this story, the challenger is asked, who was the traveler's neighbor? And the challenger says, the person who took care of the traveler. And Jesus then said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Let us pray. Dear God, you give us some pretty hard tasks to do. We know that you love us and that we should love everybody, but it's difficult. So we pray that you would help us along our way. Remind us of the story of the Good Samaritan, that we may live and grow and be more the people that you would have us be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. It's great to talk with you. I'd like to share a word with you from the law. Leviticus 19, 17 through 18, taken from the NRSV Bible. You shall not hate in your heart, any one of your kin, you shall reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. From the Gospels, Matthew 5, 38 through 39, 43 through 48. Jesus told his disciples, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of a heavenly parent. The one who makes 
the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do you do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your siblings, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly father, your heavenly parent is perfect. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. To you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There are a few stories in the Bible that have become iconic in our society, or rather there are a few of them. And, um, if I refer to them, you, you immediately know what I'm talking about. That's how you know they're iconic. Uh, there's the fall of humanity, the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent. Um, Noah and the flood is everywhere. David and Goliath, we all know that story. Each of these conjure images familiar to virtually anyone in our society, anyone, religious or not. Of New Testament stories, probably the most familiar is the parable of the Good Samaritan. The problem with the way our society associates this story is that we usually don't understand the context in which it was told. As I mentioned to the children a moment ago, the Good Samaritan isn't just about some hero helping somebody else without being asked or any compassionate person answering a need that others refuse to. The Good Samaritan begins with someone who thinks they know the answer to their question asking Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus then answering, be careful about your assumptions. Your neighbor might just be your enemy. A few weeks ago for the second sermon in this series, Doug Miller was supposed to read a couple of verses 
which I decided not to preach about at that time. You remember the scripture from Romans 12 in which Doug just rattled off a whole series of Proverbs by Paul for that curious group of Romans who had become Christians and how should they live together? That one. Well, the verses I edited out of his reading went this way. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. Hear that again. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That phrase, you will heap burning coals on their heads, I probably need to unpack a little uh, in a sermon about loving one's neighbors and especially about loving one's enemies. It reads as if we're supposed to do nice things to our enemies in order to somehow humiliate them or, or to... to uh, to signify to God that these folks are worthy of a hellbound destiny. That's, that's not what Paul meant. That's just the way it appears to us. But there is an opinion among scholars that what Paul really was saying was he, was, he was using a figure of speech. Doing kindnesses to one's enemies is going to confuse them. We might say today, it would make their heads explode. It would blow their minds. Unilateral peacemaking, Paul seems to be assuring them, will be unexpected. That's the context underlying the parable of the Good Samaritan. As I've said before, Good Samaritan was an oxymoron for Jews in Roman-occupied Palestine. That's what I was communicating to the children anyway. In the Cotton Patch Gospel, the retelling of Luke and Acts by Clarence Jordan of the Koinonia Farm near America's Georgia and one of the founders of Habitat for Humanity. Well, Jordan reset the gospel in Georgia and pictured the Samaritan as a black man who rendered aid to a white supremacist who had been robbed and left for dead on the roadside and then bypassed, incidentally, by a preacher and a deacon on their way to church. In every instant in which Jesus and early Christian writers approach the matter of our attitude toward people we hate, and Karen Armstrong points out in her 12th step, love your enemies, that this is not mere dislike or distaste that we're referring to here when we are imagining an enemy, but we are talking about genuine loathing, genuine fear, complicating an ideological stance between us and the other. Unconditional love must outweigh hate for us and impel us to do good. There has to be a point at which hostility ends. That point, Jesus and Paul and Karen argue, is with the compassionate person. Whatever it may take for us to rationalize our compassion, we have to do. Imagine the perverse environment that must have caused your enemy to oppose you, to intimidate you, to threaten you. Was, were they abused? Was, was there abuse that was allotted to them? Was it, was it cruelty? Have they been lied to about you or you about them? Why? Why are they behaving in this way? You, you have to figure that out. You don't bear any obligation to try to change their mind or to confront them about why you consider them to be wrong. You'll notice that Jesus doesn't say when he imagines a good Samaritan that the victimized Jew wakes up and has an entirely new attitude about Samaritans now. No, 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 no. That's not what he's saying. He's saying you can change. You can change your perspective. Love your enemies. No, seriously. Love them. 
because we know that the world and the way we are living it cannot survive as it is, with ideological opposites and cultural or economic elites standing off against their tribal antagonists. The way we are is not okay, and somebody has to break this system. People of other religions have noticed this as well. It's not so much that Christ was so well advanced beyond other holy thinkers that they didn't come up with it as quickly as he did, but Christianity grew up as a countercultural phenomenon while most other religions came together as perspectives of the majority and the powerful. Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, all were founded by princes and warriors. We just happen to emerge from the perspective of the oppressed. Our assertion that Jesus is king, indeed that Jesus is the, carnation, the incarnation of the ineffable and eternal God, is our justification for him to be a prince, for him not having exacted the overthrow of an earthly order, but still being the ruler of our lives and our hearts why we haven't managed since then to turn earthly kingdoms and governments upside down, but simply maintained the power-based status quo through the ages in which Christianity has been in power, uh, that's a discussion for another time. Way too long a sermon at that point. So even though it probably has a lot to do with the reinterpretation of the Good Samaritan, into somebody who just happens to be an unexpectedly nice guy rather than the last person you would want to render you aid is somehow not too surprising given the way we think in our world. Still, power religions do come around. The Hindu Mohandas Gandhi said, after all, an eye for an eye makes the whole, uh, only ends up making the whole world blind. Mind you, historically speaking, an eye for an eye had its time. That saying was a response to the human predisposition to escalate any situation. We are naturally inclined to do worse to someone who has wronged us. And as we are seeing at the, at the base of, at, as the basis of, of protests against police violence and, and the looting of businesses and neighborhoods and deadly force by citizens whom our society claims are standing their ground or exercising their Second Amendment rights while protecting their property and families, escalation never ends a cycle of hatred. An eye for an eye was actually designed to prevent escalation, but even an eye for an eye doesn't end retributive justice. It only balances it. Martin Luther King Jr. said in this vein another saying, very familiar to us, only goodness can drive out evil, and only love can overcome hate. When he said this, he was pointing to the moment in the Gospels in which Jesus was crucified and languishing on the cross, but forgave his executioner. And although we might recognize hate as a natural reaction to people who oppose or oppress us or who so offend us that we refuse to bear them anywhere, bear them being anywhere near us and we push them away, love is counterintuitive with its charity and can only be practiced with intentionality and effort. You have to work to love an enemy. Like an innocent person accepting execution and forgiving those who put them there, you've got to work to love an enemy. You don't just come up with it. Think about that. Think about the one-sidedness of that. Think about what I told the kids. This stuff, other than Jesus' example, only happens in fiction. I've never seen a circumstance in which a true good Samaritan could be identified. Because in a moment, that act of acceptance and forgiveness honestly is not going to change a system from unjust to just. Still, it might well change a heart. Enlighten, enlighten the mind of a Roman guard. Truly, this man was God's son. Or challenge one's president, pre prejudice, excuse me. Which one of the three was a neighbor to the injured man? The one who showed him mercy. Of the 12 steps to a compassionate life, 
Karen Armstrong argues the ultimate step is love your enemies. You know that sign in drinking establishments, a stranger is a friend you haven't met yet. Our savior instructs us that we have to take that concept a good deal farther. Paul speculated that people doing this would blow each other's minds, especially those of the enemies we might actually help. It'll heap burning coals on their heads, he speculated. Because that is just about as far as one can go in the development of an existence for oneself that endeavors to slip in alongside others and not just see their suffering, but to endure their suffering with them. At that point, you're going to know that you don't just pity that other person. You don't just feel sympathy for them, but you identify with them that you can cry with their cries, you can sob with their sobbing, you can laugh with their laughter, you can rejoice with their rejoicing. It means that not only will another be set free, but you are going to be set free too, with them. And it will give the world the glimmer of a new outlook and a whole host of renewing possibilities all of which are better than the state of things now. The challenger of Jesus, that guy who thought he knew the depth and breadth of the law and who inquired of Jesus about being saved, and then about who his neighbor might be, at the end of the parable of the Good Samaritan, had to admit that one's neighbor might just be the one you least expect, the one who shows mercy no matter the antipathy and, and then bridges the divide with love, expensive love. Go and do likewise, Jesus replied. That kind of love is what will save you. So love your enemies. No, seriously, love them. Amen. It is a curious thing to be a people who intentionally do good to all, whether they love us or not. We are a church of Christ, and we must lead others in ways of peace and well-being. We can do this through the ministries of the church, ministries of spiritual formation and growth, of outreach and witness, of care and compassion. This is your invitation to serve and support these ministries in a monetary way. While the health crisis continues until a vaccine is found, we won't be passing plates or collecting in person. If you are able financially and you would like to support First Church with a monetary donation, please either send a check to First Congregational Church, 10 West Blockwood Avenue, Webster Groves, Missouri, 63119. Or go to our website, firstchurchwg.org, and to our donate page. Our giving provides care and supports the ministries of our church that extend into the world for the sake of reconciling people, repairing a damaged creation, and honoring our God, creator, redeemer, and comforter. Let us pray. To you, O oh God, who welcome all in love, who forgive beyond your understanding, and who have us practice the same grace, 
we present these gifts for the reconciliation of the world, the good of the church, and the concerns of those in need. Receive and bless our gifts, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Prayers of the people, joys and concerns. Let us remember those, those people and situations from whom we are praying today. These are prayers that came to light in our prayer gather, gathering this Wednesday. Our residents in assisted living, Joyce, Paul, Sharon, Bob, and Carol, people who we love, who are living with cancer, especially Bob, Jamie, and Peter, Becky and Dave, and all those the world regard as disabled, our pastor Dave, and his family as they get ready for his upcoming surgery. And we know Pastor Dave's Dave is our bee's knees. <laughs> Rita and all those who are living with dementia and their caregivers. Peace with justice. The people of Kenosha, I'm sorry, Kenosha, Wisconsin, and Portland, Oregon. Uh, peace with justice. This faith community as we seek new staff to lead our ministries for children and youth, ourselves and all people of faith, that we may come to understand truly and faithfully God's call to compassion. I have one more prayer request. Yes. Yeah. I've, this is being filmed on a, he says we could come a little closer. You know, um, we, uh, came to the church today and um, there was some graffiti that was on the sidewalk in front of the church on and not on the sidewalk on the street but on the walk that that leads up to the church and um, racist graffiti that we found there and um, if we're going to love our enemies I think this is someone who presumes that they are our enemy and so what what I want to make sure that we are doing is holding that person in prayer that they may come to a new understanding of the world and salvation themselves. Indeed, with all of these prayers in our hearts, spoken and unspoken, let, let us pray. Dear God, we do pray for our divided world, our world of tribalism and ideology and um, narcissism and hatred. And we ask for your inspiration to come upon us and upon all those with whom we live as siblings in this world that our family may be finding its way to peace and that we may only be seeking to please our parent, you, our God. We pray for our leaders. We pray for those who serve us. We pray for those who would protect us. And we pray for ourselves that we might be more Christian as we claim to be. Make us Christians in our hearts, in our lives, in our acts, in our words and in our deeds. All of this we lift before you, mindful of our Savior who slipped in alongside us so long ago and showed us your love, your care, your compassion, and your knowledge and dream that things might change, can change. Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Only goodness can drive out evil, and only love can overcome hate. Loving our enemies means that we have to accept the necessity over and over again of forgiving those who inflict evil and injury on us. There is no more to be said. We know what we have to do. This is the end of our worship, but our work is just beginning. So, hear this benediction. Love your enemies. Seriously love them. And be at peace. Amen. That's our worship for this Sunday at First Church. Please join us for our virtual coffee fellowship at 11 a.m. on Zoom. Our worship has ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>